is from this book, The Word Unheard. My book begins with a necessary provocation, lesson, and latent anti-Semitism. The great Enlightenment playwright and critic Gotthold Ephraim Lessing was unequivocally a pro-Jewish author and political activist. Lessing was very likely the sponsor of the first published document calling for the full emancipation of the Jews in Germany, and his theological and dramatic writings on Jews and Judaism form the de facto benchmark of pro-Jewish discourse in German letters, the production of the play at the beginning of the Third Reich in 1933. After the war in 1945, many German theaters reopened with Nathan the Wise, the symbol of tolerance and enlightenment humanism, and the play is still one of the most frequently performed on the German stage today. And yet I begin, and must begin, my study of latent anti-Semitism with Lessing, the paragon of pro-German Jewish thought, uh, the, of pro let me try that again. And yet I begin and must begin my study of latent anti-Semitism with Lessing, the paragon of pro-Jewish thought in German literature and culture. I begin with Lessing not only because of his influence on subsequent authors and on German culture in general, but also because of, system, of systemic tensions inherent in Lessing's texts themselves. The three great major works Lessing wrote promoting tolerance towards Jews and Judaism, the theological treatise on the education of the human race, and the two plays, The Jews and Nathan the Wise, all question their pro-Jewish and anti-anti-Semitic enlightenment messages, and hence constitute a pivotal juncture in the formation of the rhetoric of anti-Semitism in German letters. I want to make very clear from the start that I am not arguing that either Lessing or his texts are anti-Semitic. My argument is rather this. Lessing's pro-Jewish agenda turns back on itself and subtly and programmatically questions its own basic premises in true Enlightenment fashion. This is Enlightenment criticism pure and simple, and it is operative in Lessing's works in general. As Friedrich Schlegel incisively noted, Lessing's entire life and oeuvre are defined by criticism. In both form and content, Lessing's writings enact a thoroughgoing questioning of established concepts, definitions, and thought patterns. The goal of Lessing's criticism is to combat dogma, to combat prejudice in the true sense of the word, prejudging that does not examine its own basic premises. This constant calling into question informs Lessing's writing. It is self-reflexive, self-critical, internally contradictory, intentionally polemical, dialectical, multi-perspectival, and dynamically fluid in nature. The process of looking for truth and not truth itself is at stake in Lessing's epistemology and in his poetic production. This is why it is notoriously difficult to establish Lessing's own views in a given text, and this is why it would be folly to argue that there is only one possible reading of a given Lessing text. The following discussion analyzes the language and structure of Lessing's three major works on Jews and Judaism, and demonstrates that these texts by design set up a dialectical relationship between the rhetoric of philo-Semitism and the rhetoric of anti-Semitism, and hence articulate a self-reflexive, self-critical theory of the discursive construction of the Jew. We begin somewhat anachronistically with the education of the human race of 1780, since this theological essay in many ways functions as a blueprint for the discursive construction of Jewishness evident in the earlier plays, The Jews of 1749, and the roughly contemporaneous play, Nathan the Wise, of 1779. In The Education of the Human Race, Lessing, writing from a Protestant theological vantage, sets out to account for the evolution of Christianity from Judaism or, more precisely, to explain why, in his view, Christianity must necessarily supersede Judaism, and why Christianity, as it is currently practiced, likewise must give way to a more enlightened version of Christianity, to a Christian religion of reason. Lessing's essay, importantly, is cast as a response to Reimarus and, and Warburton debating the role 
rules of reason versus revelation in recognizing eternal truths, and in fact intends to defend Judaism as a valid religion, as the historical predecessor to Christianity. Neatly, if somewhat arbitrarily divided into 100 paragraphs, the essay's rational form reflects its rational enlightenment agenda. And here, as in Kant's contemporary, co contemporaneous essay, What is Enlightenment of 1783, enlightenment is inextricably linked to the written word. Using a logical argument, motored by metaphors and internal inconsistencies, Lessing presents a history of theology, a theology of history, divided into four distinct stages. According to Lessing's fanciful historical schema, the religious development of the human race, from polytheism through Judaism and Christianity, to an enlightened Christian gospel of reason, parallels the physical stages of human development, from birth through childhood and adolescence to manhood. This phylogenetic maturation metaphor implies that the evolution of Christianity from Judaism is both a theological and a biological necessity. Moreover, Lessing equates religious maturation with sexual maturation, and he explicitly genders this enlightenment maturation process as male. Jews are unsexed children, kinda. Present-day Christians are lads or male adolescents, knaben. And pra practitioners of Lessing's new enlightenment gospel of reason are men, men. Are. According to the metaphoric logic of Lessing's argument, Jews are less than men. Ex negativo, and likely unintentionally, Lessing invokes the anti-Semitic stereotype of the Jews as an effeminate people in the very framework of his argument. Disturbingly, Lessing relies on many other anti-Semitic stereotypes and rhetorical gestures to develop his theological history of the education of the human race. The story of Lessing tells is this. In the beginning, there was polytheism. The human race, Lessing implies, without actually using the metaphor, was in its baby stage at this earliest phase of its development. Then God selected the Jews, the crudest and wildest of all peoples, to reveal himself to, so as to begin his educational plan with a clean slate, as it were. The Israelites, a people still in its childhood, raw, and clumsily incapable of abstract thought, had to be educated as one educates children, using the doctrine of immediate punishment and reward. The Old Testament, a primer for children, guides the Jews' pedagogical development. In Persian captivity, the Jews began to compare their Jehovah to the being of all beings, a more rational and more moral being than they themselves had envisioned. The Jews then turned to their long-abandoned Old Testament to blame their own immaturity on the word of God, but had to admit to themselves ashamed that they themselves bore the guilt for not having recognized the true nature of God and for not having lived their lives accordingly. Remarkably, the Jews are guilty of being Jews, children in Lessing's schema, and the Jews, who must be ashamed of their own behavior, need an outside guiding force to set them straight. Using the Persian model as an example, the Jews then became a completely different people and scoured their Bible for evidence of the truths they had seen in other religions. In particular, Lessing is concerned here with the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. But for all its richness and its hints at truth, its allegorical allusions to truth, Lessing argues, the Jews' Bible had its limits. Quote, a better pedagogue had to come to tear this tired, worn-out primer from the children's hands. Christ came. Under the tutelage of Jesus, the first reliable practical teacher of the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, the better teacher, the Israelites began to mature. The Jews became Christian the children became young men. The New Testament, the second better primer, now directs their development. Guided by a better teacher and a better primer, 
The Christians are clearly better than the Jews in Lessing's view, but their education is as yet incomplete. The Christian ethos still is motivated by a reward system, the doctrine of eternal salvation. The youths will become men when they act in a moral way, not because of a promise of salvation or a fear of damnation, but simply because it's the right thing to do. Goodness for the sake of goodness is the new gospel of reason, the highest stage of enlightenment and purity. The metaphors Lessing uses here jarringly introduce an implied impurity, an implied dirtiness into earlier stages of development. Rhetorically, Lessing casts the Jews as an unclean, impure people, excluded from the highest stages of enlightenment. Lessing reasons that it cannot be fair that those people who were born at earlier phases of, of humankind's development should miss out on this highest level of human perfection. Hence, he concludes his essay by speculating on metempsychosis, the transmigration of souls. According to the logic of Lessing's Enlightenment agenda, Jews can and should become literally born-again Christians. Just as each earlier stage of enlightenment is tied to the written word in Lessing's model, the childlike Jews are guided by the Old Testament, the lad-like Christians by the New Testament, the last stage of enlightenment, the new gospel of reason for mature Christian men, is inaugurated by a text, Lessing's own, The Education of the Human Race. In a telling self-reflexive rhetorical gesture, located at the precise center of the essay's 100 paragraphs, Lessing draws a pronounced parallel between his own writing and the clothing and style of the Jews' primer. With its allegories and instructive examples, its presentation that is at times plain, at times poetic, and full of polyval polyvalent tautologies designed to sharpen its reader's acumen, the, the education of the human race is explicitly patterned after the Old Testament. In drawing this bold connection between the Jew's primer and his own, Lessing emphasizes that the like education that Jews and Christians must undergo, an education that is to take place here through the very text of the education of the human race itself. This is why the Jews, this is why the essay's anti-Jewish rhetoric is so important. On the one hand, Lessing clearly intends to portray Judaism in a positive light defending Judaism as a necessary predecessor to Christianity, as a developmentally early stage of Christianity. And of course, historically, this is the case. Jesus was a Jew, and Christianity is an outgrowth of Judaism. On the other hand, Lessing clearly criticizes the Jews in his rhetoric throughout the essay. To be sure, from a Protestant theological perspective, Lessing must criticize the Jews. To justify the later stages of this religion, the religion of reason, as well as the prevailing state religion of the time, Lessing must explain why Judaism in this view is superseded by Christianity. Lessing arguably softens this critique of Judaism by casting present-day Christians as likewise immature. The new gospel of reason is still to come. Yet there is no sense in which the essay should be read only as a critique of present-day Christianity. No sense in which Lessing uses the Jews only as a cipher for his critique of present-day Christians. Both the form and the rhetoric of Lessing's essay belie the real object of his critique. Structurally, the bulk of the essay, almost half of the 100 paragraphs, addresses the Jews as a crude, raw, wild people, clumsily incapable of abstract thought, who are themselves to blame for their own ignorance, as children, at an immature developmental stage that must be superseded. Fewer than 20 paragraphs are addressed to present-day Christians who have yet to develop into mature adult practitioners of Lessing's new gospel of reason. Nowhere does Lessing characterize present-day Christians as crude, raw, wild, clumsy, or guilty as he does the Jews. Importantly, the essay contains no recognition no recognition of present-day Jews as practicing a reasonable or defensible religion. Unsurprisingly, Lessing's close friend and collaborator, Moses Mendelssohn, the great Jewish Enlightenment philosopher famous for his piercing intellect, blasted Lessing 
for basing his entire argument on an invalid metaphor. The human race does not undergo a phylogenetic, phylogenetic maturation process through religious stages of development as a baby progresses from childhood through adolescence to adulthood. The motivation for Mendelssohn's critique is clear. There is no place for grown-up Jews in Lessing's new gospel of reason. Adult Jews must become Christian. Despite his pro-Jewish intentions, in the education of the human race, Blessing scripts enlightenment in its highest form, the new gospel of reason, as anti-Jewish. A similar dialectic informs the Jews of 1749, a comedy Lessing identified in the, pre in the preface to the 1754 edition of his works as a serious reflection on the disgraceful repression of the Jewish people, intended to give its Christian audience pause. Irony figures prominently in the play's design. Lessing states that he tried to show, show virtue on the stage where the audience never would have suspected it, in the figure of the Jew. Yet ironically, and perhaps intentionally, Lessing's enlightenment defense of the Jews simultaneously contains a veiled but devastating critique of the Jews. The play does indeed, indeed go to great pains to present a virtuous Jew on stage, Yet this character is counterbalanced by a vaguely nefarious and certainly unsavory figure named, ironically, Christoph, who is presented as being very possibly a hidden Jew, thereby reinforcing the other character's fears of a hidden and dangerous Jewishness that pervades Christian society. Due to time considerations, I cannot present a full reading of the play here. Suffice it to say, that its surface philo-Semitism is repeatedly and programmatically called into question in profoundly disturbing ways. The pro-Jewish tolerance message of Lessing's great masterpiece, Nathan the Wise, likewise programmatically calls itself into question. But here the text self-reflexive enlightenment critique is much more subtle and much more refined than in the Jews or the education of the human race. Here, as in the earlier pieces, both form and content underscore the text's self-reflexive criticism, its constant calling itself into question in true Enlightenment fashion. On the formal level, Lessing identifies the play as a dramatic poem. This innovative genre aims to call traditional categories into question. It breaks down established boundaries and fuses together disparate genres or categories, ironically creating a new norm a new standard, a new genre. This aesthetic program is reflected in the play's content. The plot aims to break down established boundaries between the three great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and to create a new enlightened gospel of reason, as it were. Set in the holy city of Jerusalem in the 12th century, during a pause in fighting in the Third Crusade, the play revolves around a wise Jewish merchant, Nathan, who is cast as the Enlightenment figure in the text. One day, Nathan returns home from a business trip to find that his house has burned down and that his adoptive daughter, Recha, has been rescued from the flames by a Christian crusader, the Templar. Predictably, Recha and the Templar fall in love. Although the Templar tries to resist the burning desire he feels for Recha, since he assumes, incorrectly, that she is Jewish. Fortuitously, the Templar's own life has been spared by the Sultan Saladin because the Templar looks like Saladin's brother. Following some convoluted plot twists, Recha and the Templar improbably turn out to be brother and sister, niece and nephew to the Sultan Saladin. The play ends with the construction of a natural family that conjoins Christian, Muslim, and Jew. The play ends with the construction of an enlightened gospel of reason in which Christian, Muslim, and Jew are united in one big happy family. I always think we really ought to be teaching this play much more today. Unsettling, unsettingly, unsetting, setting, subtly. <coughs> You know what I mean. <laughs> However, the staying power of this universalist vision is called into question from the start. The play is set during a pause in fighting during the, during the Third Crusade. Lessing's 18th century audience knows that the religious wars will continue. 
that this happy end will not last. The play begins with Nathan the Wise, Nathan the Jew, agreeing with his Christian servant Daya that the harmonious conjoining of Jew, Christian, and Muslim is a sweet illusion or sweet delusion, ein süßer Wahn, that is sweet to him too. But at the same time, Nathan argues that sweet delusions must make way for sweeter truth. With this statement, the text underscores its self-reflexive, self-critical, realist agenda. And indeed, the plot's neat resolution is programmatically called into question by a number of troubling details that threaten to undermine the text's central enlightenment message. First, the natural family constructed in the last scene of the play faces a profound Freudian challenge, incest. From the beginning, both Recha and the Templar have been burning for each other and now discover they are brother and sister. Needless to say, the smoldering sexuality does not bode well for the future of this natural family. The blood problematic also threatens the play's enlightenment resolution on a second level, religion. Throughout the play, Nathan has been worried that Recha will disown him because he has not told her she is adopted and has not told her she is Christian. But Recha repeatedly insists that blood does not define families. Nathan is her, is her father because he has raised her, not because of biological circumstance. Ironically, however, blood does define the natural family constructed at the end of the drama. The play's happy end depends precisely on gene genealogy, on bloodlines. As if to underscore the fact that the play's re resolution is grounded in blood, the Templar exclaims to the Sultan in the play's penultimate lines, quote, I am of your blood. Given that the play aims at the construction of a natural family that, conju that conjoins the three great monotheists, the, the three great monotheistic religions in one big happy family, it is significant that Nathan the Jew is not related by blood to any of the other characters. At the end of the play, Natan de Visa, Nathan the Wise, becomes Natan de Visa, Nathan the Orphan. The Jews' problematic status in this Enlightenment family is further accentuated in the so-called ring parable, which forms the structural and thematic core of the text. Here, too, blood is the driving force that motivates the text's central religious disquisition. Saladin, in dire financial straits, summons Nathan, but rather than asking the Jew for money, decides to trick him by posing a probing religious question. Only one of the three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, can be the true religion, and a wise man like Nathan would not stay where the accident of birth of blood had thrown him. Or if he does stay, it must be because of insight, principle, choice of the better. Saladin asks, so how does Nathan justify his faith? Nathan hesitates before answering, aware that Saladin wants money and is trying to trick him, to Jew him. Who's the Jew here, Nathan asks, me or him? Nathan then considers what kind of Jew he should present himself as, and he concludes he should answer Saladin's Jewing with Jewing. Nathan decides to fob off a fairy tale on Saladin in lieu of an answer, thereby opting to present himself as an upright Jew who nonetheless engages in stereotypical crafty Jewish behavior, deception. Nathan identifies his story as both a märchen, a fairy tale, and a geschichten, a little story or a little history, a history in mini miniature that he wishes to tell Saladin before he answers his question. Nonetheless, scholars and readers have almost uniformly in interpreted Nathan's tale as the answer to Saladin's question, an answer that takes the form of a parable, illustrating the equal truth value. There is a great deal of validity to the standard interpretation. Read from a different perspective, however, Nathan's tale tells a very different story. Nathan the Jew, in fact, defends Judaism as the originary religion. Nathan tells of a ring with magic powers that made its bearer beloved in the eyes of God and his fellow men. The ring was passed on from one generation to the next, from father to son, until one day a father with three sons could not decide which of his sons should receive the ring. 
He had an artist make two copies and gave each of his sons a ring. Now, now there are three rings, an original and two artistic reproductions, indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the original. If the rings do indeed represent the three great monotheistic religions in this little historical story, the original will represent Judaism, the reproductions, Christianity, and Islam. Historically, Christianity and Islam are derived from Judaism. According to the tale, the original Jewish ring still exists, or perhaps was lost, but not destroyed. And this lost Jewish ring threatens the integrity of Christian and Islamic societies by virtue of the fact that it is the original. As Nathan puts it, quote, the right ring was not demonstrable, almost as indemonstrable as the right religion is to us now. Note the adverb almost suggests that the true faith, presumably Judaism, is indeed distinguishable to us today. In his tale, Nathan then goes on to state that the value of each ring will be proven by the behavior of, of its bearer, and that in a thousand years, a wiser judge than he might be able to identify the true ring. This suggests, of course, that the adherents of each faith must prove their religion's worth through their actions. But it does not change the fact that there is an original ring in Nathan's historical account, a ring that might be identified in a thousand years. And the existence of this original Jewish ring constitutes a challenge to the other two religions. This is why Nathan is left out of the natural family constructed at the end of the play. The Jew, by virtue of his originary status, represents a threat to the integrity of Christian and Muslim societies, and hence is excluded from the natural family's bloodline at the drama's conclusion. As if to confirm this reading, the ring tale ends with a subtle anti-Jewish gesture presented in an entirely positive light. Nathan, aware that Saladin's real motivation in asking him to justify his faith is financial, offers the Sultan money. His magnanimous gesture notwithstanding, the truth of Nathan's tale is thus Judaized by that quintessential Jewish trait, money. Nathan's ring tale is framed by money. It is introduced by money, it concludes with money, it is grounded in money. As if truth were a coin, Nathan says, in, intro in introducing his tale. And indeed, truth is a coin in the ring tale, an object presented as having truth value, as having exchange value, when in fact it has none. The tale is presented in lieu of an answer. The truth of Nathan's tale is Judaized on a second level as well. The tale, introduced as an excuse not to tell the truth, as a deception, tells a Jewish truth that is ironically the truth of the Jew. The smart Jew Nathan uses stock anti-Semitic stereotypes, craftiness and subterfuge to defend his own Judaism as the originary religion. And it is precisely this defense of Judaism, the Jews' insistence that they are the chosen people for which the Jews are criticized in the text. It is no accident that Nathan is introduced into the play in a structurally prominent position in the last lines of Act 1, Scene 1, as being, quote, so good and at the same time so bad. For all his wisdom, for all his goodness, Nathan remains the Jew with all its stereotypical associations at the end of the play. In true Enlightenment fashion, Nathan the Wise, like the education of the human race and the Jews, turns back on itself and calls its own pro-Jewish message into question. The self-reflexive gesture is entirely in keeping with the spirit of Enlightenment criticism, and I do not believe that either Lessing or his writing should be characterized as anti-Semitic. In comparison, in comparison to the unambiguous anti-Semitism evident elsewhere in Enlightenment letters, Kant's call for the euthanasia of Judaism, Voltaire's attack on the Jews as a barbarous, contemptible people who nonetheless should not be burned, or Fichte's proposal to decapitate, to decapitate the Jews and replace their Jewish heads with Christian ones, to cite but a few famous examples, in comparison with that type of thinking, Lessing clearly intends to promote a pro-Jewish Enlightenment tolerance agenda. 
It is also the case, I believe, that we simply cannot read Lessing's writings on Jews and Judaism as they were read in the 18th century. Our post-Holocaust eyes perforce read the anti-Jewish moments in these texts more critically, and perhaps with an ineluctable implied teleology. Still, these anti-Jewish moments in Lessing's writings must be read, and not simply read over or excused away as not existing. This is precisely the point of the three close readings I have offered here, to demonstrate a structural homology that must be accounted for in any study of Lessing and the Jews. At the limits of his Enlightenment discourse, Lessing's pro-Jewish writings turn back on themselves, programmatically and self-critically. Whether Lessing intentionally wrote this critique into his texts, as I have proposed, ultimately is a matter of little consequence. Intentional or not, the anti-Jewish moments in these texts constitute an important juncture in the history of the formation of the rhetoric of anti-Semitism. Thank you. I'm handing out a text for um, Professor Sachs's talk, and he's going to begin in a few seconds, but please take one, pass it around. There should be enough for all of us.